Good morning and welcome to Matins on this Monday of the second week after Pentecost. Thank you for being with me this morning. Our scriptures today are Psalm 56, excuse me, Psalm 57. And uh, our Old Testament reading, we're going to uh, move into Proverbs chapter 10. And for our New Testament, we're going to get into a new book. Uh, we're going to start First Timothy and we'll begin right at chapter 1 today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us as we come into your presence from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal, we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Our psalm, then, is number 57. Let your glory be over all the earth. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge, till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, and they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let us pray. Lord, send your mercy and your truth to rescue us from the snares of the devil, and we will praise you among the peoples and proclaim you to the nations, happy to be, happy to be known as companions of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, our first reading is from the 10th chapter of Proverbs. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest 
is a son who brings shame. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but on the mouth of the wicked, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. <clears throat> the wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so <clears throat> interesting that in chapter 10... <laughs> We see this, the Proverbs of Solomon. So what were the first nine chapters, right? So um, this is a general collection of Solomon's Proverbs. This, this starting at chapter 10, going all the way to chapter 22. This royal collection reflects only a portion of the Proverbs spoken by Solomon. And it references 1 Kings chapter 4. Unlike the first nine chapters, which consist of several tightly organized addresses, these 12 and a half chapters are less closely knit together. The purpose of these sections accounts for the difference. Chapters 1 through 9 encourage the reader to turn from sin and folly and pursue wisdom in the fear of the Lord. This section, starting at chapter 10, demonstrates what wisdom and folly look like in practice. Reading it reminds us of our own folly, our own rebellion against God. Most of the Proverbs in chapters 10 through 15 are two lines long, expressing a contrast designed to give instruction in wisdom. Okay, so that's the overall tone of what we're going to read for the next few days. Um, we're going to skip around a little bit, but um, that's what this section of this book looks like. All right, uh, so the first five verses, this links this collection with the 10 sections of chapters one through nine, also addressed to a son. A wise son makes a glad father. The use of this term in verses one and five, the prudent son, and the son who brings shame, frames this section as a literary unit, emphasizing the blessings that may come to a family through, the, through diligent and honest labor. Many proverbs connect a son's behavior or character to the well-being of his parents. Just like the good works of Jesus' followers reflect the glory of their heavenly father, right? What's the baptismal charge? Let, this light sh let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Same thing. All right. Treasures gained by wickedness. All right. This, you know, this first one, verse one, is pretty self-explanatory. This does not necessarily mean outright theft, although that would be included. could just mean fraud, dishonesty. that may appear to be right on the surface. Both the seventh and the ninth commandments forbid this type of stealing. Hmm. Um, righteousness delivers from death, not the outward righteousness evidenced by honest labor, but righteousness that comes through faith in the Lord in here. It is a gift of God through faith and is not earned through obedience to the law. Right? Righteousness delivers from death. Uh, that kind of righteousness. Uh, because it is the Lord who ultimately delivers the righteous and frustrates the wicked, a person's relationship with him, right? Always figures more prominently than any human works in receiving spiritual or material blessing. Okay, so um, having this relationship with God um, yeah, will be the more obvious thing than... Um, anything we do the relationship itself 
will be more evidence of your faith than your um, outward acts, I guess is what the proverb's saying there. Um, a slack hand causes poverty, laziness. Hand of the diligent makes rich. Kind of obvious, right? Work hard. You'll be more blessed than if you are lazy. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean just um, monetary poverty and monetary wealth, okay? We're also talking about spiritual poverty and spiritual wealth, emotional poverty, emotional wealth, okay? He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. This is, it's, when it's time to work, it's time to work. You don't work when it's time to work. This is more of that laziness, okay? You shame your family. Okay, all right. So that's the first five verses. Then we move into six. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. All right, this note here is a translational note. Let's see what it says. But violence covers the mouth of the wicked is another way. Um, and this same note applies to verse 11. The mouth of the wicked conceals violence or violence covers the mouth of the wicked can be translated both ways apparently okay blessings on the head of so and we've talked about this before you can't expect god to bless us if we're being wicked and disobedient that's the story of the old testament if we try if we make an attempt to be righteous to be the kind of children he has called us to be, it opens the door for him to be able to bless us. You don't grant privileges to a child who is being disobedient. You punish them. You restrict them. God can't lavish blessings on us of whatever kind if we're being disobedient. Uh, the mouth of the wicked conceals violence or violence covers the mouth of the wicked. That, I, that one makes more sense to me. Um, yeah, violence is, uh, yeah, violence and wickedness go hand in hand, right? And it may not be coming out of their mouths all the time, but it's there and it wants to come out. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. We will, yeah, I mean, that's, Someone who's a righteous person. Think about how we think about people like Mother Teresa, um, Gandhi, um, Pope John Paul. Some of, these, some of these people that have made huge differences in the world by their righteousness. Now, I, I mentioned Gandhi on purpose, not a Christian. But look at what he did with his life. We think of him fondly. The name of the wicked will rot. Contrast that with Hitler, Stalin right? These people were tyrants, horrible. Every time you say their name, people, you know, Hitler, you know, you sneer, you, you think of it in dis disdain. It's, you know, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind, right? How do you want your name to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as a blessing? Oh, she was such a good human being, right? He was such a good man. He was, you know, how do you want to be remembered? Your actions will affect how people remember you. The wise of heart will receive commandments. In other words, wise people will listen. They will listen to God's commands. But a babbling fool will come to ruin. Um, again, you know, are you going to talk over God? Are you going to close your mouth and listen to what God commands you to do? Whoever walks in integrity walks securely. He who makes his ways crooked will be found out, right? Well, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive, right? The more, when you lie, 
you have to often lie to cover the first lie and you get into this, you know, if you always tell the truth, <laughs> you, know, you don't have to remember what you said because the truth is just there. You, you, you don't have to worry when you, when you always tell the truth. There's no, you, you don't have to worry about being found out. You know, it, lies will always eventually be blown open. Always. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble. This is a gesture connected to evil intent, perhaps as a signal between those involved in sinful schemes, right? A wink usually means you're lying about something. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble. A babbling fool will come to ruin. There's the babbling fool again. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. The mouth of the wicked conceals violence. There's that again. But if the mouth of the righteous person, if they're righteous, they're going to follow God's commands and how they should speak and conduct themselves. And it's just going to be refreshing to be around that kind of person, right? It's going to be the kind of person you want to spend time with. It's going to make, it's, it's going to lead you closer to your own righteousness, right? It's just a good thing. Hatred stirs up strife. Yeah, look around our society, right? There's hatred everywhere. Love covers all offenses. Instead of escalating strife by speaking words of hatred, the righteous speak words of forgiveness that are prompted by love. Even though these offenses occur, love overlooks, forgives, and yields to them, not carrying all things to the extremity of justice. Ooh. <laughs> wow. So this is what Proverbs is going to look like. And we are not going through all 22 verses, right? We're going to read from chapter 15 tomorrow, chapter 17 on Wednesday, and then we're going to skip ahead to chapter 21. Um, we're going to bounce around a little bit this week. So uh, 21, yeah, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we'll cover sections of chapters 21 through 25. So bounce. we're going to get the feel of it. There's a lot of good wisdom in here. There's a, And there's a reason. It's, the wisest man who ever lived, right? King Solomon. Um, we would do well, even, yes, it's Old Testament. Guarantee you Jesus is in here. Guarantee you that. Something to consider. Anyway, all right. So let's, let's get on to 1 Timothy. All right. Chapter 1, we'll read verses 1 through 17. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command, of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God, that is, by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow. Let's start. Okay. So Timothy. Timothy is Paul's spiritual son. He has trained him, raised him as a, as a pastor to become bishop over other pastors as Paul is aging and less and less like, likely or able to make trips to these churches that he has founded. We think this letter was written in the early 60s, 60 to 65, somewhere in there, which means that Paul probably would have been in his 60s or so. Oh, my goodness. What did I just do? I am so sorry. There we go. Okay, so, um, yeah, so Paul is getting older, and he is making sure that the church carries on after he's gone, because it's not the church of Paul, it's the church of Christ. So, he begins with his typical, this is who's sending this letter, Paul, I'm writing this letter, here's who I am, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, right? God saved us by sending his son where our hope lies, okay? He's not an apostle because he wanted to be himself. He's an apostle because God made him an apostle. Timothy, my true child in the faith, right? That's how dearly Paul holds him in esteem, his, his, his very, his true son. His, well, my, my spiritual child, my true child. Here's the greeting. All right. This, as I urged you, Timothy, when I was going to Macedonia, stay at Ephesus because you have to stand against the false teachers. Okay. All right. Oh, and here's the other thing. Sorry about this first part. What Paul is writing here is not just his own words but the words of God, okay? That's part of why he's writing this. He wants him to know, God has told me to write this letter, okay? So, um, this, is, this site in Ephesus was uh, the site of long, Paul's longest missionary tenure, um, Look at Acts chapter 19 and 20. It was a large seaport city on the western coast of what we know today as Turkey. Um, so, a charge, think in military terms. This is a strict instruction that must be followed. You're going to tell these certain persons, these heretics, these false teachers, do not teach a different doctrine than what this church was founded on. You know, what those false teachings are, I think we're going to find out as we go through this. Um, so this, um, this different doctrine, um, this is a Greek term that only appears in one other place, and that's uh, later on in, in this same book in chapter 6. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament. So, um, he also wants these teachers to not devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Um, these are, you know, a myth is a fictional story, doesn't do any good, has no spiritual value. Endless genealogies, probably, probably, we're not sure, but probably talking about, um, the, the lineage in the Old Testament that had become a source for speculation. Um, somebody had started making allegorical tales 
which had all but replaced the gospel in the minds of certain, certain of these new Christians. The, that's these speculations, right? What we really want, don't focus on this stuff. Focus on stewardship from God, right? Stewardship, good order that is by faith. How has God taught us? Is this what's important? Is it these, these myths and these endless genealogies? These, these things that, well, you know, depending on how that lineage went, what, is this, what does this mean for our church? No. What does good order in the church look like according to what Christ has taught? The aim of our charge, okay, Timothy is to charge these people, but it's Timothy and Paul together. The aim is love. Where's that love come from? A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Oh, what a combination. That's like a very recipe for church success, isn't it? <clears throat> All right. I'll catch up with myself here. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, these fruits of faith in Jesus cannot be produced by false doctrines or myths or genealogy. You're not going to get that. I'm sorry, this, this love from myths and genealogies and speculations and poor doctrine. You're going to get it from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of faith in Christ. <sighs> Certain persons, again, false teachers, heretics, by swerving from these, pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith, have wandered away into vain discussion. They're having debates that doesn't serve the church or God's mission. They want to be teachers of the law, right? Well, that's Pharisees. Without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions there. Does that sound familiar? Do we know anybody that goes off on a, on a tirade, ranting about something, and it turns out they really don't know what they're talking about? Either they're uneducated or they're lying, but boy, they sure sound confident. Um, so this is um, talking about the law of Moses here, okay? And Jesus and Paul have both been teaching, well, Paul because Jesus taught it first, and, and the other apostles, the law doesn't get you in good with God. The law tells you, oh, you're not in good with God, and you can't do anything about it. You need Christ. We know the law is good if you use it lawfully. The law is not bad. It just points out sin, right? It's not a bad thing. It's not law, bad, gospel, good, okay? God's law has been written in the heart of the people. A law was given to the first man immediately after his creation. He was to conduct himself according to this law. Don't eat from that one tree. You can, mess on, you can play around on the tree. You can mess with it. Just don't eat the fruit from it. That was the law. That was the whole law. What Paul means is that the curse of the law cannot burden those who have been reconciled to God through Christ, nor must the law confuse the regenerate with its coercion, for they have pleasure in God's law in the inner man. Okay? Law, for those of us who have the gospel, the law should not drive us to despair. The law is good. It can teach us but it should not drive us to despair for those of us who know that we have forgiveness in Christ because the law is just showing us what our sin is and showing us how we need to conduct ourselves in godly ways. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and dis <coughs> pardon me, for the lawless and disobedient, the ungodly and the sinners. All right. We're going to spell that out. What does that look like? Okay. The law is to tell you what your sin is. Is this sinful or not? That's what the law was originally for. Here is how you must conduct yourself. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Do this. There's a few of those in there too. Most of it's 
don't eat this, don't say this, don't do this. Okay. Who are the ungodly and the sinners? The unholy and profane. Okay. They have no reverence for God or, or the worship of God. Those who strike their parental abuse, hit your father and mother, not showing them the honor that God commands in the fourth commandment. Murderers, sexually immoral, any sex outside of marriage. Men who practice homosexuality. There it is right there right? Enslavers, hmm. those who take someone captive in order to sell them into slavery. Liars, perjurers, so people who lie, people who lie in a court of law, which is even worse, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted, that gospel, one of Paul's really long sentences. Did you notice that? These three verses are all one big long sentence. All right. So let's let's take a look at that real fast. All right. All right, we read that part. Okay. Kidnappers are the enslavers involved in illegal slave trade. Remember, some slavery was part of their economic system. These are people who do it illegally take people captive. Um, sound doctrine, again, is a phrase used only by Paul and only in the pastoral epistles. It implies that the so-called teachers of the law in verse 7 in Ephesus were peddling unhealthy and diseased doctrines, right? Different doctrine. Where is it? Uh, sound doctrine. All right, this gospel, this is the good news that we are saved eternally from the law's condemnation through faith in Jesus. That's what the law does. It condemns us, right? Uh, it is the only means, the gospel, by which sinners can be cleansed and saved. God is described as blessed in the New Testament only here and in chapter 6. God is the source of all blessedness, which he gives to believers through the sound doctrine of the gospel. As one of the apostles, Paul has been entrusted with this gospel. So this epistle, and we're not done yet, I know, we've got a few more verses. This, this is written to stop the teaching of false doctrine in the Ephesian churches and to promote the teaching of sound doctrine. So... Our sinful nature sometimes leads us to be unconcerned about the doctrines God has given us in his word. But when this happens, we're guilty of being poor stewards of the gospel. The gospel has been given to us. We've been entrusted with it. What are we going to do with it? In the good news of Christ, we are given a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, all of which enable us to receive God's gift of sound doctrine with thanksgiving and eagerness. All right, let me finish this. All right, we got five more verses here. I thank him who's given me strength because he judged me faithful, pointing me to service. Christ did this for Paul. Paul didn't seek to do this. Why? Because he was a blasphemer. He's the one who was having Christians arrested, seek, hunting them, sending them, having them arrested, sent back to Jerusalem to be persecuted. He was one of these persecutors. He was an opponent of Christ and the people of his, of his um, budding church. But Paul received mercy because he acted ignorantly. It was just ignorance. The grace of, of Christ overflowed for him, right? With the faith and love that are in Christ. This is how Christ acted toward Paul and how Paul wants to act towards the people. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Paul calls himself out. Why? Because he was killing Christians. But I received mercy specifically for this reason, so that Christ could display his perfect patience in the worst sinner. If Paul can be forgiven by Christ, anyone can be. 
to serve as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. This is that praise, right? All right, let's wrap it up there. We'll keep going. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, words cannot measure the boundaries of love for those born to new life in Christ Jesus. Raise us beyond the limits this world imposes, so that we may be free to love as Christ teaches and find our joy in your glory. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness. O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity, and in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen.
And that, brothers and sisters, concludes our matins for this Monday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, I hope this is a blessed start to your week, and I hope the rest of your day goes well. Um, I expect this week to be our usual schedule, Vespers tomorrow and Matins the rest of the week, so I hope you can join me for at least some of that. So until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.